We are so glad that you are with us today. We've been praying for you this week, praying as many of you are in the fast, praying that you'll experience God's presence. And really, just before we even jump in, we just want to tell you we love you. Yes. And uh, we, we uh, are so thankful that we get to be here today to jump into the Word. But before we do, I want to encourage you, over the next couple, next two weekends are like the best weekends of the year to bring somebody with you to church. I mean, you've got people in your lives that don't understand uh, the relationship that we can have with God through Jesus, and these next two weekends are so powerful. So don't just wait till Easter. Uh, next weekend, Palm Sunday, is probably one of our favorite uh, Sundays of the entire year. So. Yeah, and while I'm up here, I just want to give a shout out to all the girls of the house at all of our locations. I'm so excited because we're on the countdown to Amazing, and Amazing is the time of year that we gather all the girls of the house um, of every generation, and we have an amazing night together. And, um, and I'm telling you this now because you need to mark your calendars. Every year we sell out. So it's the second week in May. I want to see all of you there, and it's going to be a life changing. It has the potential to change your life. It's going to be great. All right. We are in our last week of the series, So Will I. And we've been talking about what it really means uh, to be a Christ follower, a Christian. And that if we are going to follow Jesus, then we have to do what Jesus did. Yeah, we kicked off the series when we kicked off our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And what I loved about that message is that, Todd, you taught us that, that there was nothing in this world that Jesus was born into, nothing in the natural that would be able to give him the strength that he needed to have to fulfill his mission on the earth. And so he needs to regularly be able to disconnect from the natural to connect to the supernatural. And Jesus regularly fasted and he prayed. And so what we got from that was that, hey, if Jesus needed to fast and pray, so will I, That's right? That's right, yeah. And so many of you are probably fasting for the first time and you're smelling every hamburger that is being grilled in South Florida. I, understand, I feel your pain. But let that pain just push you to prayer and we know that God's gonna do some great things. Yeah, so good. And then last week, you know, you talked to us about that, um, that, that people mattered to Jesus and that love does. And what I loved about this is that Jesus not only cared for the spiritual condition of people's hearts, but he cared about the physical condition of their lives. He cared about their eternity, but he also cared about the quality of life that they had here, so much so that he spent his days raising lame people up to walk, opening up blinded eyes, healing the lepers. He spent his days making people's lives better their lives here on earth better. And I love that. And you know, what? Um, the, the, the big takeaway for me was that if Jesus, if Jesus would give his life, if he would, if he would if that he gave generously and that, that he served tirelessly yeah. just to reach humanity, then so will I. Right. Church, you do that so well. And we're gonna keep doing and that. So will, yeah. we. So will we. So will right? we, right? And so in this last week, what we wanna look at is a couple things that Jesus did right as he was starting his public ministry. We're gonna read three passages and let you, uh, you'll see what we're talking about here. Matthew chapter four, verse 18. This is as Jesus was calling his disciples. He said, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting their nets into the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and they followed him. And then going from there, he, Jesus, saw two other brothers, James, the son of Jebedee, he was calling their name out, and his brother John. And Jesus called to them, and immediately they left their boats. See what I did right there? So good. The phone was ringing in our campus here at Garden, so that's, you maybe didn't hear it. Uh, and immediately, he saw them immediately, they left their boat and their father, and they followed him. Yes, and then in Luke 5, 27, it says, later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi, again, he got up, he left everything, and he followed Jesus. And then in John chapter 1, verse 43, the next day, Jesus decided to go to the Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said to Philip, come and follow me. Yeah, what I love about this is that this is what kicked off Jesus' public ministry, but this is what laid the foundation for what he would do in the years to come. This is what he did. Jesus saw people, yep. he found people, and he invited people. Yeah. Write that down. He saw people, he found people, and he invited people. And he calls, he's calling us to do the same. You know, the point is, is that Jesus saw people not just for who they were, 
but for the potential that he saw in them and for who God created them to be. When he saw Peter, Andrew, and Matthew, he didn't see ordinary fishermen or a regular tax collector. He saw the men that would actually join him to begin a movement that would actually shake the very gates of hell. That he saw, he saw them as the people that would begin the movement that would bring hope and life back to humanity. And then he, he saw them and then he found, he found people because he sought them out. You know, he, he found them because he was actually looking for them, right? And this is what we need to do. We need to be looking for the people, for Jesus to see. And so he, he sought them out. And when he found them, he invited them. He invited them to join him on his mission. Yeah, and I want you to notice something, that when Jesus called his disciples, he doesn't say, follow me, and I will make you better. He doesn't say, follow me and I'll make you a better husband or I'll make you nicer or a better uh, friend. He doesn't say that. I think following Jesus will do those things, but that's not what Jesus was talking about that day. He had something way more important that he called them up to when he called them that day. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I will send you out to fish for people. See, they were not called to just follow. They were called to fish. They weren't just called to follow, they were called to fish. I'm gonna make you fishers of men. And so the title of my message today for all the guys is Jesus went fishing, so will I. Okay, so all you fishermen, you can use that one. Yeah, it's so true because all throughout the New Testament we see, we see that there's this correlation between being a follower and being a fisher of men. You can't really have one without the other. He said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so when you follow, he begins to make you a fisher of men. He didn't say, come follow me and I will make you better. He said, come follow me and I will make you a part of something greater, something bigger. I will give more purpose to your life than you could ever hope, dream, or imagine. I will use you to be a part of a movement like he did the disciples, a movement that could actually bring hope back to the people of, of the earth and back to the people in your lives. See, when we follow him, he invites us to be a part of something eternal. He first, he first, he rewrites our story and then he uses us. He uses us to be a part of other people's God story. Think about it. If you are a Christ follower in this room, right? You didn't get here by yourself. You, somebody, somebody had to tell you the message it wasn't just, you, you didn't, um, God, God used someone to carry the message to you. And see, none of us were saved by the message alone. God actually used a messenger to bring you that message. Yeah, so if you think about who was that person in your life, you know, for me, it probably started with my parents when they started teaching me about Jesus when I was young and did our Bible studies at home, but it literally was a volunteer Sunday school teacher when I was in the second grade. And I went to church once, and that's when it clicked for me. And what she shared in that lesson, whatever that was that day, that's when I knew I've got to follow Jesus for myself. And I prayed in that little Sunday school room up in Georgetown, Kentucky, because that lady was there serving. Yeah, think about who that was for you. It might have been a student pastor at a student service. It might have been a friend who invited you to church. All of us have someone that saw us. They saw us, and they, they were the messenger to bring that message of hope. You know, the message needs a messenger. And if you are a Christ follower today, I want you to know something. You are someone's messenger. You are someone's messenger. See, this is the point. Seen people see people. Those of us who have been seen by Jesus and have experienced the love and the hope that he has brought into our lives, and we've experienced the grace and the love that's changed us, it helps us, it, 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 it causes us to see people different. Seeing people see people differently. You know, I think about that song where it says that every precious one, it's a child that you came to save. And if you gave your life to love them, so will I. That, that line gets me every time, so will I, because somebody, somebody did it for you. And you know, um, I was doing a Bible study a while back, and, and in the Bible study, they, they gave you an action step, and the action step was to write a letter to the person who was responsible for, for bringing you to Christ, for carrying the message of hope to you. And so, so I, I wrote this to, um, to the person responsible for bringing me to Jesus, and I just wanted to read it to you. I haven't actually mailed this yet. Um, I, I'm gonna be mailing this this week to my sister, and I just wanted to read it to you 
you because every one of us could write a letter like this. And it says this, Dear Terry, as I sit down to write this letter, my mind and my heart go back to a time when you were in a 10th grade student at Suncoast High School and I was your 12-year-old sister that was following in your path. You were a popular party girl with lots of friends and I learned quickly how to cover your tracks when you stayed out too late or went to that party that you knew you were not allowed to go to. And I knew that you would do the same for me. One day, all of that changed. You changed. You started going to different parties, and I stopped having to cover for you. You changed in different ways, too. You were happier, and you had a sense of purpose. I remember you told me that a friend from high school had invited you to a youth group and guaranteed you that there would be some really cute guys there. So you went. And that you found, and when you went, you found a lot more than just cute guys. You told me you got saved. That sounded really weird to me. I had only been, I had only seen saved people on Christian television, and I wasn't really sure that I wanted any part of that. But you invited me to come and see what you were talking about. I resisted, but you persisted. I remember that night at youth group, the first night I went, and I had no idea why people had their hands in the air. It all seemed so strange to me. But by the end of the night, I realized that these people had something that I wanted. The next time I went, I heard a message that Jesus had a purpose and a plan for my life. And I raised my hand and prayed that prayer. I prayed that prayer again and again every time I messed up in the coming days. I think I might have prayed the salvation prayer about 14 times. I'm not sure which prayer stuck or who gave the message on the night that it stuck. I'm not even sure what to do with my story theologically. But what I am sure is that you are the one who brought me to the place that I would experience the presence of God for the very first time. And from that moment on, you brought me into a place, it, it, from that moment on that you brought me into that place, the trajectory of my life radically changed. It changed where I would spend eternity, and it changed where I would spend my Friday nights through high school and college. It changed my earthly destiny. It changed the type of person I would eventually marry. You are the main... <laughs> You are the main character in the opening chapter of my God story. You are the messenger that God used to bring me the greatest message of all. Thank you. I love you, Julie. Every one of you, every one of you has a letter to write. There was someone that saw you, there was someone that found you, and there was someone that invited you. And God wants to use you in people's lives. He wants people to write you letters because every message needs a messenger and you're gonna be somebody's messenger. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 10, around verse 13, he starts writing, he says, everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a beautiful promise right there. But then he goes on to say in verse 14, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him, right? That makes sense. And how can they believe in him if they've never heard of him? And how can they hear about him unless somebody, what's that word? Tells them. Guess who that somebody needs to be? That somebody needs to be you and me, right? So remember, we're not called just to follow. We're called to fish. Now, we know this to be true, and I think most of us even say we want to tell other people about Jesus, right? We want to follow and we want to fish. And if I were to ask for a show of hands across all of our locations, if, if you would say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus, many, many hands, most of the hands in the room would probably go up. But then if I asked you if you've gone fishing this week for somebody to find Jesus, many of those hands would, would drop down because, you know, we have all sorts of reasons why we don't want to fish. Yeah, and don't feel bad about that because, you know, there are, in, in the Bible, there are spiritual gifts. And not everybody has the gift of evangelism. Yeah. There is a true gift of evangelism. You know, those are the people that go into Publix for a gallon of milk, and while they're there, they lead the, cash, the cashier to Jesus. And those people just, I'm jealous of those people because they can, they can lead someone to Christ. They go to the food court, and people are getting saved at the mall, and that's why I go, but it doesn't ever happen like that, right? But most of us, that's not, that's not our story. We don't all have the gift of evangelism. And, and so many times when we have that opportunity, when, when we feel like, oh, the heavens are starting to open up, I might be able to step through this door and have that conversation I've been waiting to have. You know, we just get nervous and we freeze up and we're just afraid. A lot of us deal with fear. And there's no shame in that. We deal with fear. We're afraid so many times. And so many times we're afraid because we, we might think we don't have it all together. You know, my life isn't perfect. We don't have it all together. I've made so many mistakes. Why would anybody listen to me? And I want you to hear me, that you don't have to be perfect to be God's perfect choice. 
You're not perfect, but you are God's perfect choice. Listen to this um, verse in 2 Corinthians. It says this. He helps us in all of our troubles so that we are able to help others who have all kinds of troubles using the same help that we ourselves have received from God. You know, we're all on a journey. Yeah. It doesn't say that when we get saved, we are fishers of men. It says that he is making us right. fishers of men. This is a process. And so many times we let fear take us out. You know, I was thinking about Kristen and, and Kristen you know, moved to Florida because she was having a lot of struggles with addictions. She moved here to get help. She went to our Celebrate Recovery program and she found the answer to all of her problems, which was Jesus. But she was still on a journey. But God started to use her to bring other people along. She, he used her mess. He used her message, her, he used her mess and it became a message. And she could have thought to herself, well, why would God want to use me? You know, so many times the very thing that we think is going to take us out is what qualifies us to be the best messenger. Right. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have it all together. But I want you to know that you are God's perfect choice yes. and you are God's perfect voice yeah. to speak his message over the lives of the people that are closest to you. That's good. Preach yeah. it. The second thing that sometimes we get afraid of is we're afraid we don't have all the answers. Like, what if I get into a conversation with them and they ask me something like about, does Adam and Eve have a belly button? I don't know if they had a belly button. Who did Adam and Eve's kids even marry? I don't know. I can't think about that. Did Noah have dinosaurs on the ark? I, we, there's so many we don't, yeah. things we don't know, right? And so you can, let, you can get frozen by fear that they might ask you something that you don't know and then you're going to look crazy. Hey, you don't have to have all the answers. Jesus, when he said, you will be my witnesses to the world, he didn't say you will be my attorneys. Nothing to prove. Lots to share. Witness just shares what they know, what they've seen, what, they, what they've experienced, right? And so there are people that God has placed in your life that he wants you to reach that I will never be able to reach. They're at your school. They're at your workplace. They're in your family. They're your circle of friends. And God's put you sovereignly there. And you might think, well, Todd, this is probably easy for you because you're a pastor. You're a pastor. It's kind of what you do. You're probably good at it. Let me let you in on a secret. Um, when we're at, with people that we don't know and they ask the question, so what do you do? <laughs> and we tell them we're a pastor. Oh my goodness. You should see them run for the hills. I mean, they're like, I gotta get another break. <laughs> Conversation break. killer. It is. Right? It's just yeah. like, it's over right there. Right? And, and so you've got to take what you've got and use what you have, use the circle of influence you've got, where God's placed you, use what you've got. Yeah, remember that verse about Levi that we read at the very beginning of the tax collector? The next verse in Luke 5.29, it says this, that Levi held a large reception at his home for Jesus. A huge crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. You know, he didn't have all the answers. He was figuring things out himself. So you know what he did? He just threw a party. Yeah. And he invited people. And you know who he invited? Not pastors, right? Not pastors. He invited tax collectors, the people that he knew, the people that were in his life. And, and he had been seen by Jesus. And now he saw people. He saw people differently. And he wanted them to experience the life that Jesus came to give them. You know, you all have people in your life that we can't reach, but you can. That's right. And God has put a story inside of you. You know, look at what this says in 1 John 5, 10. Why don't you say this with me out loud at all of our locations? Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony of God in them. You've got the testimony, the story of God in you, and it's your story. And you can break, break your testimony down into three parts. Uh, basically, what my life was like before Christ, how I came to realize I needed Jesus in my life, and the third part, the difference he's made. And nobody can argue with that. You don't have to prove that. That's your story. You get to share that story with them. It's not complicated. Yeah, think about it. You know, people could care less about what some pastor may say or a theologian would say, but they can't deny your story. Yeah, right. Your story is a God story. And you know, 85% of people that would come to faith, they come because a family or a friend, a family member or a friend shared their story with them. So go out and share your story this week, these next weeks. The third thing that sometimes gets us hung up because we're afraid uh, is that we're just afraid uh, of looking weird. Yeah. Like, what if we come off weird? I don't want to come off weird to these people, like a crazy... G Have you seen crazy Jesus people? Yeah, there's like, a lot of weird There's Christian weird Christians in there. the world. There's, yeah. They're just weird. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you've seen them on the street corners. Mm -hmm. Turn or burn. I think they got a picture of this guy. Look at that. Yeah. Who, as if that's going to help anybody come to Jesus? 
Or maybe somebody holding the banner going, repent of your sins, you wicked people. Be baptized. I mean, repent. That's not going to. And so we're, we're afraid of looking like that. We're afraid of being interpreted like that. And so we've got to realize we don't need to. Have, hold yeah. on to that fear. We don't have to be that. We don't yeah. want you to be that. Please, please don't. Please don't do that. But I remember when our student pastor, right, when we were in high school, he decided this would be a really great idea to send high school students door to door to knock on doors and ask them the question, if you were to die today, if you were to die today, do you know where you would spend eternity? And so we would, you and I we were faithful. We did this, you know, and we prayed. We prayed so hard. We didn't pray that people would come to know Jesus. We prayed that they would not answer their doors, right? <laughs> so this is... This is how it was. So you don't have to be weird, right? And we don't want it. We don't want you to be weird. But you know, this is the this is the truth. There's, I I remember there was only one time in my life that I wasn't afraid because this is one of the reasons we, we're afraid, you know. And there's only one time that I remember I wasn't afraid, and that was only because I was really heavily medicated. And some of you. Some of you might remember the story that several years ago, Todd and I um, had a romantic summer getaway to Colorado, um, and Todd had this great idea that he wanted to go mountain biking, right? And so he convinced me of this, and, and I had read all the marriage and relationship books, and I knew that you know they always have these lists, the, the top 10 things that a husband needs from his wife, and the wife needs from the husband, and the number two thing on that list is that husbands want to have recreational activities with their wives, right? And so I wanted to make sure you know, that I was investing our marriage, investing in the number two, and so I went mountain biking, even though I never rode a bike on flat road for probably the last 10 years, right? So we went mountain biking, and, and we were on the way down the mountain, and I can laugh about this now, by the way. So we, we were on the way down the mountain, and, um, and I, my, I lost control of my bike. I hit a rock. I went flying over the handlebars several yards, landed flat on my back. I blacked out. When I came to, um, I could feel nothing below my neck, and I thought, my life has changed forever. But then in a few minutes, the shock wore off, and I began to feel the effects of a broken back, a broken shoulder, five broken ribs, and a concussion, and I was in terrible shape. Well, they brought me to the hospital, and that's where I spend, I spent the next several days. And while I was in the hospital, um, it, it, was, it was such a long journey. Todd, you know, was there by my side every step of the way. Um, his parents came to us. Uh, two of our friends, David and Marla, came and stayed with us. And, and so while we were there, we started to build a relationship with some of the nurses, and one of the nurses his name was Lauren, and, um, and we, we specifically just tried to build that relationship, and, and you know, we were getting ready to go um, as I was getting ready to be dismissed from the hospital, and Lauren came in the room, and she said, you know, I just want you to know I've seen something different in your family. You know, I've watched the way that your husband loves you and, and the way that, you know, his parents just, the, the love in this room is just so evident, and these friends that would fly halfway across the country, and I sat there, I, you know, all of a sudden I went, this is it. This is the reason all this happened. I mean, I asked myself the question, why is this happening to me? And how could I have been so foolish to think that I could even do this? And I thought, this is making sense of all of it. She is my reason. And so I begin to tell her, you know, all about um, Todd and, and I and, and, and how our marriage, you know, it's not a perfect marriage, but somehow we need to invite God into it. And so when Jesus gets in the middle, it changes everything. And, and that these people that had flown across the, the country to be with us, they were actually in our small group from church. And, and if, it, if it had been anybody in our small group, it would have been the same story. And all the messages and cars were from people like you that were praying for us. And, and so I just begin to tell her the difference that God could make in her life and, and and that Jesus, that, that we're not special, that, that the same difference Jesus has made in our lives, he wants to make in your life. And I just shared the whole message of salvation. And so in my morphine-induced state, I literally thought that she was going to drop to her knees next to my hospital bed and give her life to Jesus Christ. But that was not what happened. She looked at me and she said, well, I'm glad that church thing is working out for you. And I was like, really? I almost died for you. And that's all you have to say? See, she went on to tell me that for her, church was this rules and regulations, and she had been hurt in the past, and she didn't want to expose her children to that. She had this warped view of church and what it was and what it was supposed to be and the role it could play in her life. And, and you know, so many people that you, you know, work with and go to school with and, and are at the ball fields with, they have this warped view of what the church is. They have a preconceived idea, mainly because they've actually never been to our church, right? They've never been here, so they don't even know, right, what this is all about. And you know, sometimes we can get a warped view of what this is all about. We can actually start thinking that this is for us, 
Because you hear us say a lot that this isn't just a building you walk into, it's the family that you can belong to. This is where followers can become family. But I want you to know that this place isn't about us. We're not just followers, we're fishermen. And God has called us to be fishers of men and not just keepers of the aquarium. So this is what God, God's message, yeah. So this is what, what we're called to do. And, and the problem is if you haven't brought anybody with you that is far from God right. and brought them to church lately, you'll, you'll get a warped idea of what this yeah. is. You'll think it's about you and about what your kids need and what, it's, we wanna minister to all of us, but we have been called to reach those that are far from God or that are searching for God and help make it easy for them to find God, amen? You know, the, the New Testament has a lot of metaphors about uh, that the disciples used to try to describe the church. As you mentioned, it's, it's not, a, a, a building is not, a church, that it's a family. That's one of the metaphors that Paul uses. He also uses uh, the metaphor of a body, that we all have different functions. We're all parts of this body, but the body as a whole has a function, and that function is to bring the hope and the light of Jesus to a world that is desperate for it. Right, and this whole idea of sharing Jesus and sharing your faith, it can be scary, but this is the good news. It can be really scary if you wanna do it alone, yeah. but the good news is, is you don't have to, right. and you weren't even intended to, yeah. right? We, when, when Jesus called you to follow him, he never intended you to follow alone, yeah. and I want you to know, he never intended you to go fishing alone. We're in this together. Yeah. We're in this together. We're like the perfect partners together yeah. to help people find Christ, right? We want this place to be the place that you can bring people that uh, have questions about God that maybe you don't even know how to answer. And we want when they get here that they find what they're looking for. The disciples didn't have all the answers either. In fact, um, earlier Jesus called Philip. We read that verse about him calling Philip. And then Philip goes to find his friend Nathaniel to tell him about Jesus. And this is what it says in John 1:45. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And then Philip goes, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Nathaniel asked. And then look what Philip says. All he says is, come and see. Come and see. He didn't try to prove anything to Nathaniel. He just said, Come and see, because Philip knew if he could get his friend into the presence of Jesus, that would change everything. Yeah. And we believe the same for you. Yeah, and we want you to know the pressure is off. The pressure is off. You can't know all the answers, but you can invite people to just come and see, right? Come and see. And see, that's what invited people do. Those of us who have been invited into a relationship with Jesus Christ, invited people invite people. And you will be a part of someone's God story if you just invite them to come and see. You don't have to have all the answers because you know that when they get here, they're gonna experience a Jesus who has all the answers. You don't have to, to give them purpose. You don't have to decide you know, what, what they need. They can come into the presence of the Jesus that knows what they need and is here to meet every need. See, that's what church is. Church is the place where you can say, Come and see. Just get here. You know, there's a scripture in, um, in Matthew 18, 20. It says, for where two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am with them. Yep. See, when it says in his name, that means when, when two or more people gather on official Jesus business, yep. right? You know, right. worshiping him, yep. hearing his word, yep. Yep. he promises that he's gonna be here. And this is the important thing we need you to remember is that this is as close to the presence of Jesus that your unsaved friends will ever get. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. This is as close as to the presence of Jesus that your unsaved friends will ever get. Right. They have not experienced the presence of Jesus in their life. They haven't experienced the comfort and the peace that he came to bring, but when they get in this place yeah. and they experience the presence of Jesus when they're, when they're in the presence. Now remember, God is omnipresent. He is everywhere, but there is something different about the manifest presence of Jesus. We are gathered under his name, under his authority, when we're lifting praises and, and we, we realize that the Holy Spirit is free to work and to reign and to rule in this place. It's different. And this is as 
close as your unsaved people, as unsaved friends can get to that presence, and yeah. it will make all the difference. I've had people that have come, friends of mine that, were, uh, that aren't walking with the Lord, I invited them to church, and, and they sit up in the back somewhere, and they'll get down and they'll go, oh my goodness, like, well, they use a different word, and they'll go, uh, the vibe, oh, the, the vibe in there is like so they, they can't even find the words. To, they've never experienced it before. And they said, I don't know why, but I sat there and cried through the songs. Why was I crying? They were experiencing the presence of God. See, so we want, we want to make it easy for people to find God and hard for people to forget God. Every weekend, that's why we, we do what we do. It's why so many of you serve in the parking lots and at the doors and help get the sanctuaries ready at all of our campuses. And you're there to make it easy for people to find God, removing the distractions so that people walk out and go, I never knew church could be like this. I never knew that, 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 that people actually look like they want to be here. Because we do want to be here, right? We love this place. We love what God is doing. We believe the church should be enjoyed, not endured. Right. And so we're celebrating that and making it easy for people. Yeah. And we see this happen week after week after week. People coming to know Jesus, finding new life in him. Generations changed for eternity because of the, the response to the message. But your friend or your family member, they're not going to know. They're not going to know that we're waiting for them unless you tell them. The message needs a messenger, and you are the messenger. You know, I want to share a story about Veronica. She almost missed the opportunity to, um, to be the messenger and, um, and to see the difference that it would make in the life of her friend. So let's watch this story together. Almost eight years ago, I had the opportunity to work at a company, and I was working as administrative assistant, and my boss, her name is Vanessa, and as I was working for her, it was clear to me that she didn't have a relationship with Christ. She didn't know the Lord. I was in a time of my life that I was just tired of living the same life, just in a dark place making horrible decisions in life and just I knew a lot of people but I was just felt alone. As time began to pass I realized the only thing that I can do is just be active in prayer. One day I was having a conversation about a service that we were going to have at Christ Fellowship and Vanessa heard me having this conversation. Can I go? She's like, oh yeah, um, let's meet up and you know sit with you. So we went and, and I really loved it. I, you know, Pastor gave a great word. Everybody was so welcoming and loving. And then she asked me if it was okay to come one other time, which she did. And then that second time is when she accepted the Lord as her Savior, Jesus Christ. A couple of months later, my sister, 14 years old, accepts Christ. And the same way, she joined the life group. She did start serving. We both started serving. And just three, four years later, our parents accept Christ, and now they serve, they lead journey, they lead ministry, and they do life groups, so. You should have not prayed. Honestly, I wouldn't be who I am today. And our family, some of them would not know the Lord, because God has used our family to impact our extended families. Every conversation we have with people, every prayer we do for those that we work with is going to have an eternal impact. I'm very thankful for her listening, being obedient to God and to the Holy Spirit to really be bold and speak the gospel anywhere. I am so glad that someone saw Vanessa Someone found Vanessa and someone invited Vanessa. And this is Diane, and I just wanted her to read her letter to you. A letter to my sister, Vanessa. I have so many different reasons to thank you. I could thank you for teaching me to braid my hair or for teaching me how to apply eyeliner. I can thank you for teaching me how to balance my checkbook or uh, write my first resume. I can thank you for teaching me how to drive a car and always letting me borrow your car when I was first learning. That was really brave. But what I will forever be thankful is for the invitation you gave me to visit a service 11 years ago. Never would I have guessed that an invitation to go watch you be a part of a, a skit at a church would result in my heart being captivated by the love and joy of the house of the Lord. Thank you for never looking, looking at me as your tag-along little sister, but as a young girl 
eagerly looking for value and worth. It was because of that invitation that shortly after, my true value and worth was found as I stepped forward to invite Jesus into my heart. I had no idea that this invitation would change my eternal destination. Like many people, I know you probably ask yourself if you will leave a mark on this earth. I stand here today to tell you that the trajectory of my life, the life of so many people, including our parents, has been forever changed. Because of your willingness to step out in faith and invite me to church, I have now had so many opportunities to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our neighborhood and the nations of the world. Thank you. Thank you for loving God and his children so passionately, so passionately enough to extend this invitation because it has changed so many lives. so good. The message needs a messenger. The message needs a messenger, and you are the messenger. That's right. So since you have been seen by Jesus, seen people, see people, invited people, invite people. So our challenge for you this week is I want you to go out this week, and I want you to tell at least 10 people, repent for the kingdom of God <laughs> is at hand. Or, or you can give them one of these, right? You can, you can take my assignment. You can give them one of these. You get to choose. And invite someone to the most persuasive place on the planet where they are going to experience the presence of Jesus and have an opportunity to respond to the greatest message that humanity's ever known. And I believe that one day people will be writing you a letter saying thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for telling me because I didn't know until you told me because how will they know unless you tell them? As we close today in prayer, um, I want to ask at all of our locations. Let's stand together as we prepare to pray. Just ask you don't leave just yet. Um, and campus teams, you can get ready to close. We're gonna pray a couple prayers. We're gonna pray that God opens our eyes this week and that we will see the people that are all around us that, uh, that need Him, that need a relationship with Him. They may have religion, but they don't have a relationship. And this is the week that you're gonna, your eyes are gonna open up to that. But I wanna pray for those of you that are here today that maybe you don't have that relationship yet. We're talking about this joy and this hope that can only come from Jesus and you're missing that. Well, let me tell you, it starts in a relationship with him and we wanna pray with you to help you start that relationship today. You don't need to wait till Easter to start that relationship. You can start that right now today and it will change everything on the inside of you. Campus teams, let's pray together. Let's bow as we pray. God, I wanna thank you today for your word that challenges us and reminds us that uh, the message needs a messenger. It reminds us today that we would not be here today if it weren't that somebody somewhere told us about Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would use us this week, open our eyes so that we can see the people all around us and then open our mouths. God, help us to open our mouths and tell them about Jesus. And Lord, I pray if we don't know what else to see, do, we just say, come and see, just come and see. If you just come and see, you'll see that he can make the difference. So we continue to pray if you're here today and you need that difference in your life. You need him to turn some things around on the inside of you. You need him to come in and make everything new. Let me tell you, friend, it starts and begins in that relationship with Jesus. All you gotta do is open your life up to him and say, Jesus, I want everything you have for me. I don't wanna miss it anything. And he'll step in and he'll make all things new. And so I'm gonna pray this prayer. And if you would say, Todd, include me in this prayer to start this relationship with Jesus or maybe to restart a relationship that hasn't been where it needs to be. Right where you are, would you just slip your hand up and say, Todd, that's me, I need that prayer today. Yeah, just hold it up high. Don't be ashamed, hold it up high. Let Jesus know, let, let the Lord know you want what he's got for you. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, we're gonna pray this prayer together all across this room. Uh, those of you with your hands up, you just keep your hands up as your signal of, of uh, testimony before God. But all of us pray this, say, dear Lord Jesus, dear Lord Jesus I, need I need you in my life. Forgive me of all my sin. All my past, all my past and, make me a new person. and make me a new person. Fill me with your joy, Fill me with your joy. and with your presence. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, church, let's thank God for those today that made this decision. I saw your hand, so did heaven. And if you pray that prayer, we have a, a Bible we'd love to give you. We'd love to pray with you. Our prayer team will be up here to pray with you. Church, we love you. Go out this week with eyes wide open and see some people that need Jesus. We love you, God bless.